Thank you for our leaders, our workers, our members, our invitees. We're praying that tonight there will be a heavenly touch. We pray that you turn every life around in Jesus' name. Change all the sadness to gladness. And the sorrow to rejoicing. And take all the infirmities away from the bodies of your people. Set your people free. Just one touch and everything will be all right. We pray that you open our eyes to behold wondrous, wonderful things out of your word tonight in Jesus' name. Teach us yourself. And our lives will never be the same again. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless everyone. You can sit down. So happy to be with you once again at the Bible study. And I appreciate our people who are coming for the first time. I pray that the study will be simple enough for you to understand and for you to get the benefit of the study tonight in Jesus' name. And for our old timers, fathers, mothers, pastors, overseers, and workers, I pray that the study will be deep enough for you to get something to. So it will not be like I knew that before. God is going to touch every life. Tonight we're coming to the study of the word of God in John chapter 9. John chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 1. And tonight we're looking at it from verse 1 all through to verse 12. Verse 1, and as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents? that he was born blind. And Jesus answered, Neither had this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God shall be made manifest in him. Verse 4, I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man of the clay and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way therefore and washed and came seeing. The sage and the neighbors therefore and they be that before which before had seen him uh, that he was blind said, It's not this he that such and begged, some said, This is he. Others said, It's like him. But he said, He said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, how were thine eyes opened? He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and uh, I received sight. Then said they unto him, When you see, when, where you see, and he said, I know not. That's the passage we are looking at today. As you look at the passage, it might appear very simple. Of course it is. But you see this particular miracle of healing of the man that was born blind is recorded only in the gospel according to St. John. And it occupies the whole of chapter 9, this miracle. And all the events surrounding the miracle came through the inspired pen of John the Beloved. Only John has given us this record and this sign of the Messiah. You understand? As John was writing, he specially chose the miracles that he wrote about. Although he was led and directed by inspiration, but he was going to show that this is the Christ. And this is the Messiah. This is the Son of God. And he gives us signs and miracles and wonders that go to prove that indeed 
This is the Christ. As you look at the whole chapter, even beyond the verses I've read to you, you're going to discover, number one, the mystery of suffering, of veiled and resolved. It was a mystery to them. This man was born blind. How could that happen? A person that came to the world, apparently innocent, and then he was born blind, was a mystery behind this. And the disciples were surprised, and they said, was he himself a sinner before he was born, that he became blind even at birth, or were the parents sinners that was born blind? That was a mystery to them. And thank God Jesus resolves every mystery in our lives. Number two, it shows the majesty of Christ in Revelation. You can see the demonstration of the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ. He wasn't perplexed about the problem. He wasn't surprised about the problem. He knew what to do, and the man received his sight. And Jesus said, it is so that the glory of God will be manifested. And you can see here, eventually the glory of God will be manifested. And when Christ comes into your life, and when Christ takes over your life, the, God, the glory of God will be definitely manifested in your life in Jesus' name. Uh, can, can you see here, if you look at verse 1 again, it said, As Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. If you read Matthew and Mark and Luke, you'll find other blind men that Jesus healed. But you're going to find something there. Those blind men, they appeal to the Lord Jesus Christ. The thou son of David, Jesus, have mercy on me. But in this case... The man did not approach Jesus. It was the love of God. It was the initiative of the Lord Jesus Christ himself that came on this man and he received his miracle. Sometimes you're slow in asking God about what you need. You don't even know what you need. But Christ takes the initiative and he shows his love unto you. And he comes to you before you come to him and a wonder happens in your life. Not only that, you're going to see as we look at the whole story, the ingratitude of carnal, natural, unsaved, sinful men. All those Pharisees as they had, all they could think about was the Sabbath day. How could Jesus do that? On the Sabbath day, they were not thinking of the darkness in which the man had lived all these many years, and they were so ungrateful, and then eventually they called the parents of this man that was born blind, and they said, is this your son? Was he born blind? How did he receive the sight? They said, well, that's our son. And as the fact that was born blind, that stray was born blind, as to how he received this miracle, we know not because they were afraid that they will drive them out of the temple, out of the synagogue, if they confess that it was Jesus Christ that healed their son. The ingratitude of carnal, natural, sinful, unsaved men in the world. You're going to see another thing, the blindness of the Jewish leaders. They were so blind themselves that they couldn't see that this is the Christ and the blindness of the whole nation. But we'll see beyond that the beauty and the benefits of solitary faith in Christ. This man, without the support of a father, the support of a mother, or the support of religious people around, solitarily, individually, he believed of the Lord, and he did what the Lord told him to do, and he received his sight. Nobody can hinder you from receiving your miracle. If you make up your mind that solitarily, as an individual, I'm going to take the Lord Jesus Christ for his word, I'm going to accept what he says, a miracle will come your way. Miracle of salvation will come your way. Miracle of healing will come your way. Deliverance will come your way. If you make up your mind that you are going to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, all the benefits of Calvary will be yours. And then we see the courage of standing alone and standing firm without compromise, without compromising with the religious and blind leaders of the land. And you see the man, if you read the whole chapter, he stood firm like you're going to stand firm. He was courageous like you're going to be courageous. And then he said what he knew. He said, he made claim, he anointed my eyes. I went and washed, and now I came seeing. All my blindness is gone. And then they argued this one, they argued that way. He said, I don't know about that one thing I know. Once I was blind, but now, 
Once I was blind, but now it's going to happen to you. You'll be able to say, once look at my condition, but now praise the Lord. Things are not the same anymore in Jesus' name. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he did before, he's still able to do today. And as he opened the eyes of the blind in days gone by, he's still opening the eyes of the blind even today as we believe on him. That power will never change. That power is there with you tonight. We're looking at Psalm 146, Psalm 146, I'm reading at verse 8. You're going to see that this is what God does. He's still doing it, and he's doing it in every life. Psalm 148, 146, and I'm reading from verse 8. The Lord openeth the eyes of the blind. It says, the Lord openeth. It's a continuous thing. He did it before, he's doing it today. He'll forever do it until we get to glory in Jesus' name. The Lord openeth the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises them that are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. We're looking at uh, Isaiah chapter 42. You might be saying, Praise the Lord, I'm not blind. Hold on. You might be saying, Praise the Lord, I can see. Maybe you can see physically, but uh, look at what this is saying. It tells us in Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42, and I'm reading from verse 19. Who is blind, but my servant, or deaf, as my messenger, that I said, who is blind, as see that is perfect, and blind as the Lord's servant. You know what that is saying? It says, you might not be physically blind, you might even be born again, you might be a servant of the Lord, and you might be a person that already says, I know the Lord, I visited Calvary, I prayed, I repented, I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm a soul winner, I'm a worker, I'm a leader in the house of the Lord. Look at that again, who is blind, but my servant, you're blind to the future. You're blind to deep, deep things in the word of God. You're blind to the provision of Calvary for you. You're blind to the things you could be and the things you could do. It says who is blind as my servants or deaf as my messenger that I sent. Who is blind but a seed that is perfect, blind as the Lord's servant, seeing many things, but thou observest not. And then it says, Open it the ears, but he heareth not. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness' sake. He will magnify the law and he will make it honorable. He's going to do something in your life. Yeah. That blindness spiritual, he'll take away. That blindness physical, he'll take away. Yeah. That blindness uh, prophetic, he'll take away. Yeah. And that blindness that is, you know, hereditary, is going to take away in Jesus' name. Yeah. In Luke, I'm reaching from chapter 7, verse 21. Luke chapter 7, and we're looking at verse 21. Look at what God is doing today and what Christ is still able to do today. It tells us in Luke chapter 7, verse 21, and in that same hour, the hour has come. In that same hour, he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits and unto many that were blind, tell me, he gave sight unto many that were blind. He gave sight. And I need to remind you that Jesus Christ has not changed. His power has not changed. And all the possibilities in his name, those things have not changed. And he gives sight to those who are blind. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 26, and we're looking at verse 18. Acts of the Apostles chapter 26, we're looking at verse 18. It says to open their eyes and to turn them from the power and uh, from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. You can see that very clearly there when God sent out, when Christ sent out Paul the apostle, he said, I'm going to pass that same miracle unto you, miracle ministry unto you, that you will open the eyes of the blind. 
their eyes are blind to the benefits of Calvary. Open their eyes. Their eyes are blind to the interpretation of the Old Testament. Open their eyes. Their eyes are blind of the reality of who Jesus Christ is and what position, what power, what privilege Christ brings us into. Go and open their eyes. He'll open your eyes tonight. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and here we're reading from verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we're reading from verse 4. It says, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. That's a more terrible kind of blindness that the God of this world has Satan with all their tradition. Satan, with all the idol worship, Satan, with all the occultism, Satan, with all the evil things that pagans do. It says that uh, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake, for God, who commandeth the light to shine out of darkness, a shine in our hearts. He'll take the blindness of the heart away tonight. And then he says to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You are in for something. You'll get everything God has provided for you tonight in Jesus' name. In 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 11. 1 John chapter 2, verse 11. But she that hateth his brother is in darkness, and he walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness has blinded his eyes. The people that are going about with hatred, hatred in their hearts, hatred in their consciousness. Hatred is a, a consumptuous, a subconscious life. Hatred within them. Hatred oozing out of them. Their words are words of hatred. Their thoughts are thoughts of hatred. Their mind is the mind of hatred. And their disposition is that of hatred. Everything about them is of hatred. And it says they do not know. They are blind. Because the darkness of that hatred, of that character, has blinded their eyes. And thank God, blind eyes are opening tonight. And the Lord will set you free in Jesus' name. But you know, somebody may be blind and he doesn't know. Because he can see the four walls of the church, he says, I'm not blind. And because he can see the street and labels and uh, whatever it is, he says, I'm not blind. Because he can see the sideboard on the roads, he says, I'm not blind. Look at this in Revelation chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 17. It says, because thou sayest, I am rich. Thou sayest, I am rich and increase with goods, and have need of nothing, and knoweth not. This is the pity of it. And knoweth not there is a tragedy in it, and knoweth not this is a danger, and knoweth not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. That's the verdict of Jesus Christ. He wants to open our eyes. And there are some people that do not even know that they are blind. And Jesus said, the danger, the tragedy, the pity is that you are wretched, but you don't know. You are poor, you don't know. And you are uh, kind of uh, blind, and you don't know. He says in verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness appear not, and anoint thine eyes serves, uh, thy eyes with eyes serves, that thou mayest see. Tonight I will see. I said tonight I will see. You'll see the glory of God in Jesus' name. Tonight we are tackling the message, Christ's power over sin and suffering. Christ's power over sin and suffering. And you know we've read from verse 1 to verse 12, and I'm dividing the passage to three parts. Number one, the opinions and many fallacies in their culture. You see, everybody comes from a particular culture. You are from Nigeria here. There's the Nigerian culture. Even within Nigeria, in the east, there's the eastern culture. In the north, there's the northern culture. In the west, there's the western culture. In your tribe, there's the 
culture of your tribe. And the same thing with those people at that time. Uh, the children of Israel, they had their culture. And the nations around them, the pagan nations around them, they had their culture. And many of the opinions were wrong. And they were fallacious. That's why we're looking at number one, uh, the opinions and many fallacies of the, in their culture. Point number two, the outcome of man's foolishness and corruption. The outcome, the consequence, and the result of man's foolishness and corruption. Number three, the obedience of meaningful faith in Christ. Understand? The obedience of not just faith, meaningful faith. That's what you are going to have tonight. And when that faith is activated within you, and it is manifested through you, you are going to have a recreation in your life, a turning around in your life, a transformation in your life. Signs and wonders will follow you home in Jesus' name. The obedience of meaningful faith in Christ. Tell me number one there. The opinions of many fallacies in their culture. Come back to uh, John chapter 9, uh, and I'm reading from verse 1. And as uh, Jesus passed by, he saw a man uh, which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who, is, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither had this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. The opinions and the many fallacies in their culture. Why did they ask a question like this? Number one, the fact. What's the fact? They saw the man. That's a fact. The man was blind. That's a fact. The man was born blind. That's a fact. Number one, the fact. Number two, who did sin? This man had sinned before he was born, and so he became blind. That's a fallacy. The fallacy. Number three, the falsehood or the dependent sin, and because of the sin of the parents, this man was born blind. The falsehood. Three things in this part. Number one, the fact. Number two, the fallacy. Number three, the falsehood. Let's first of all look at the fact. I'm looking at verse 1 again. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. That's the fact. The man was born blind. And the man could not tell. He just knows, I know I'm blind, but I don't know the reason why. Look at verse 20. In verse 20 it says, His parents answered them and said, We know, this is a fact, this is a fact, that this is our son. That's a fact. That's our son right there. And then it says in that verse 20, And that he was born blind. Blind. You see, there are people that have some predicaments or some uh, diseases or some challenges, even at birth. Let me show you something. We're looking at Matthew chapter 19. This is a fact. It happens to different people. In Matthew chapter 19, I'm reading from the first part of verse 12. Matthew chapter 19, reading from verse 12. It says, For there are some eunuchs. Those, uh, those, are men, those are men who are impotent, who cannot relate with the women, even if uh, they take a woman to themselves. It says in verse 12, it says, For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb. It's a fact. It's a fact. You look at life, you see that that man lame from birth, that other man blind from birth, that other man impotent from birth, that other man and it will be dull from birth. That other man, that's the fact that these are things that happen to people. And they, but the solution is in Christ. I said the solution is in Christ. But you must face the first fact first. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3. And we're looking at verse 2. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried. Whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful to ask alms of 
them that entered into the temple. You see this man again. We read of another man here. He was lame from birth. We are saying that there are things that we see in people that they couldn't help it. That's the way they were born. And, uh, but the question is, whose fault is that? Was that his fault or was it the fault of the parents? But first of all, we notice the fact. You might notice a fact in your own life. It will be a fact that is a spiritual, a fact that is social, a fact that is physical, a fact whatever it is, but you know that this is this. But that's not the end. Jesus will solve our problems. And Jesus will wipe all those seeds away. But we cannot shy away from the fact as number one, that the very thing and the very thing we're looking at is that this is a fact. I was born this way. This is a fact. I had this disease from birth. Look at it in chapter 14. In chapter 14, I'm reading here from verse 8. It says, There sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. You know, it's from birth. That had happened. And so, I've shown you enough scriptures for you to understand, number one, the fact. I go to number two now, which is the fallacy. The fallacy. Let's come to uh, chapter 9 of John. John chapter 9, and I'm reading here from verse 2. His disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin this man? Think about that. The disciples looked at the man, and here is something he said. Who did sin? Did this man sin before he was born, that then he was born blind? You might uh, wonder at that and say, how could adult people, believers, those who have been following Christ for some years now, how could they say that? You see, sometimes after we are born again, we're born again, our hearts are changed, our hearts are transformed. But the notion we had before we were born again in a particular culture, all those notions, they still need to be corrected. The culture that we grew from, the things they were saying. If we don't deal with them, we'll be carrying those things in our head, those things in our mind, and then we'll say, this problem is because of this. You are born again. This problem is because of that. And yet you are born again because of the fallacies we carried from our unsaved, uncircumcised, unconverted state. Why did they say that? The Jewish people looked at some scriptures and they misunderstood those scriptures. The Jewish people, they looked at these scriptures, they misinterpreted the scriptures, and the misinterpretation of those scriptures made them to feel that somebody might be born with a particular deformity because of the sin he committed before he was even born. Look at this. We're looking at Psalm 51. Psalm 51. I'm reading from verse 5. Psalm 51. Reading from verse 5. It says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Some misinterpreters of the Bible. Some false preachers in the, of the Bible in the Jewish land, they said, there you are, there you are. David said, I was shapen in iniquity, and in, in sin did my mother conceive me. That means that even when he was not yet born, he had done some things wrong, and then he could be punished for that, and so this man could have been born blind because of what had happened before they were born. Remember, that's a fallacy. It's not correct. It's a misinterpretation of the word of God. Why do we say that? Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The same thing for you, the same thing for me, everyone who are born in sin. And if we are born in sin, that one is blind, why are you not blind from birth? That one is lame, why are you not lame from birth? And so it was misinterpretation of the word of God. Look at chapter 58, Psalm 58. And I'm reading from verse 3. The wicked are estranged from the womb. 
they go astray as soon as they be born speaking lies some interpreters of the bible in the jewish days they said you see that you see that these people because they was they were kind of a sinners before they were born because they were going astray because they were born because they didn't live right at the time they were born they said before birth they had, had that challenge and that problem and therefore this is happening to them from the answer of the lord jesus christ you understand it was a misinterpretation of the word of god by those uh, jewish people i'm looking at isaiah chapter 48 and verse 8 isaiah chapter 48 and we're looking at verse 8 and you'll see the reason why they developed that kind of fallacy and that kind of erroneous teaching that some people could have those deformities before they were born isaiah chapter 48 i'm reading from verse 8 it says ye thou hadest not ye thou knewest not ye from the time from that time that then ear was not opened it says for i knew that thou wouldest deal very treacherously and was called a transgressor how from the womb called a sinner a transgressor from the womb understand what that simply means is that adam and eve had sinned and their sin passed on to all their offspring and therefore everyone that is born of a woman is a sinner all have sinned and come short of the glory of god it is it is not only when you began to tell lies when you began to do evil that you are a sinner you are a sinner by nature and it says we were all sinners by nature and then the jewish people went ahead a step further they said uh -huh. if we're all sinners by nature some sins we have committed before we were born we could not be carrying some infirmity and some deformity and jesus said no it's not that this man had sinned how could he have sinned a real sin a practical sin a definite sin a punishable sin before he was born he said no look at this question now and we're looking at uh, matthew chapter 16 Matthew chapter 16, we're reading from verse 13 and reading from verse 14. So you see the, the basis of their fallacy. Uh, are you there? Matthew chapter, tell me, chapter 16, what verse are we looking at? Verse 13, hurry up, hurry up. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Think about that. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Look at the answer. This, and they said, some, not everybody, they said, some say that was John the Baptist. Look at that. Some, Elias, Elijah. Others, Jeremiah. And or one of the prophets. Look up here. Why did they say that? They saw the miracles of Jesus and they, see, they saw the signs and all the wonders and in their mind they said, well, you understand, it's John the Baptist that died, there's reincarnation. And then Jesus Christ now was born, but was John the Baptist before. That's what they thought. Because the Herodians and all the nations around them, they believed the erroneous teaching of reincarnation. And did not pass that on to the children of Israel. And the children of Israel, if they saw somebody doing good, they'll say, okay, that's Elijah that came back to life. They'll say, that's Elisha that came back to life some will say that's jeremiah that came back to life on the other hand if somebody had a problem that man was born blind you know what they said that man had lived in the world before and when he was in the world before he was a bad man he was a wicked man he had done evil because of that night was born into the world and now all these calamities are happening to them that's what the hindus believe and that's what all those religions that do not have the light that's what they believe and it seeped into the nation of israel that's why the disciples now are asking jesus what these people are saying is it true that this man now as he was born blind he must have been a sinner in the other world jesus said don't ever talk like that there's nothing like reincarnation i said there's nothing like incarnation 
that that thing is false. We'll see number one, the fact. Number two, we'll see the fallacy. Number three, look at the falsehood. We're coming back to John chapter 9. John chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 2. It says, his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin this man? This is, this is a falsehood now. Or his parents that was born blind. Or his parents that he was born blind. You see, the children of Israel had another challenge, another difficulty. And they were misinterpreting some of the scriptures. And the Lord had corrected them. But they will not take correction. I pray that we will take correction. I will take correction. I said I will take correction. You see, there are some people, they've been going to White Garment Church before they were born again. And there were some ideologies and some opinions they were giving in that place. Now they are born again. They still believe in those errors. They still believe in those ideologies. There were some people that were in the other religion, not Christian religion, another religion before they were born again. And there were some things that they had taught them and told them that, well, any bad thing that happens, that's God's predestination. That's the way God wants. And that is the work of God. If somebody dies, dies in an accident, that's the work of God. If somebody is blind, that's the work of God. If somebody is poor, that's the work of God. If somebody goes to school and he's not reading and he failed the exam, they said that, that's the work of God, that's the way God wants and now we are born again and the things we heard before and the things we have known before in our culture, that is wrong we're still carrying that, everything be washed away from your mind today uh, let's look at Jeremiah chapter 31, Jeremiah chapter 31 and we're reading from verse 29, Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 29 in verse 29 it says in those days they shall say no more the fathers have eaten a sour grape and the teeth and the children's teeth are set on edge you know what they were saying among themselves they said well we are all right we're all right but our fathers did evil our parents did evil that's why we're suffering and god said don't say that again. Every man will bear his own body. Don't say that again. Everyone will be punished for his own sin. That you will not say that in Israel again. What God said they shouldn't say again. They still kept on saying that. And that was their falsehood. Look at Lamentation. Lamentation chapter 5. And I'm reading from verse 7. Lamentation chapter 5 verse 7. Are you there? Lamentation chapter 5 verse Okay, uh, one, two, three, go. Read it out. Uh, you, you see that? They said, our fathers have sinned and are not. They have gone. Our fathers, you know, there's some people, look up here. There's some people, they are going through some hard times. And then they are saying, you know, they are born again, the children of God. They are born again. They have given their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. They say, I, I, I know the source of my problem. I know the source of my problem. My parents were pagans. My parents were evil people. They have died now. And what is happening to me now, I'm carrying the result and the consequence of what they did. Christ will deliver you. Christ will set you free. Whatever anybody has done, daddy, mommy, grandfather, great-grandfather, and now you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, those things are cancelled. Yeah. Uh, look at this again, look at this again. Our fathers have sinned and are not, and we have born, we have carried, and we are suffering their iniquities. Look at Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 18, I'm reading from verses 1 and 2. Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 1 and 2, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Watch me ye, that she used this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, ye shall not have occasion anymore to use this proverb in Israel. Did anybody say amen? amen. The Lord said, we shouldn't say that again. We shouldn't use that kind of opinion again. And we shouldn't get ourselves bogged down by doses again because they are 
fallacies. Now we have learned that the children of Israel had many false opinions, many false, many fallacies among them because of the Jew, because of the Jewish people themselves misinterpreting scripture and because of pagan nations around them and through that misinterpretation of scriptures and the influence of false religion, some believe that sickness, suffering, calamity, deformity, accidents, whatever, came because of sins committed before their birth. But God said, nothing like that, nothing like that in your life. Yeah. Nothing like that in your family. Yeah. Nothing like that in your business. Yeah. Nothing like that, your spiritual life in Jesus' name. You know, somebody, somebody is born again and it's always backsliding, always backsliding. He is not saying that I'm the indulgent one. He's not saying I'm the careless one. He's not saying I'm the, I'm the one that is not well consecrated to God. He's saying, well, you know, that, that's what always happens. They say that there will be no Christian in our family. My father, my mother, and then our great, great, great parents, they say that we will not be Christians. Thank God I'm a Christian. I say, thank God I'm a Christian. You're being a Christian, you're being successful and victorious and righteous depends on you and does not depend on them. All those cuts are broken tonight. And then others believe that God was punishing innocent babies for the sins of their parents. But Jesus said, no. In your life, he said, no to calamity. He said, no to all that tradition. And know to all those erroneous things in Jesus' name. Look at chapter 9, verse 3. Chapter 9, verse 3. Jesus answered, Neither this man sinned, for this man to be born blind, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. The time has come for God to make manifest his work in your life. To destroy the works of the devil. And to set you free. I'm free tonight. I said, I am free tonight. I said, I am free tonight. But now, let's look at another thing. We're looking at point number two. The outcome of man's foolishness and corruption. The outcome of man's foolishness and corruption. We need to set everything straight. Because you see, already we have learned, if anything happened at the time you were born, you will not look back and say, maybe that happened before I was born, because I was a sinner before I was born. God said nothing like that. And then you say, maybe because of my parents, my parents sin. He said, no, nothing like that. But there's another thing. The outcome of man's foolishness. After you are born into the world. After you are now living your life in the world. There are things that happen that we ourselves cause. That we can say, this has happened to this person because of his own sin. Now that he is alive. A man, is, you know, he has learned how to drive and he's driving. But before he drives, he went to drink and he's drunk. And now he's driving an accident happens because he was driving as a drunk man. Whose fault? At that time, God's fault or his own fault? His parents' fault? The fault of the safety road uh, people? Whose fault? It's so fault because he was drunk and then he was driving. And then he might even injure other people. That's why we're looking at this. I'm looking at Matthew, John chapter 5. We're looking at verse 14. John chapter 5 verse 14. After what Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. This is not a baby, it's an adult. This adult had received a miracle. He had received for 38 years and God Christ healed him. And after that healing, God said, Jesus said, you're now responsible. Be a responsible man. You know, whatever happens to you now, don't say, it's my father, it's my mother. You sin no more, lest a worse thing happen unto thee. Let's look at uh, Psalm 107. Psalm 107. We're reading from verse 17. Psalm 107, verse 17. Fools because of their transgression. Look at that. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, are afflicted. 
You see, we are now adults. We are not believers. If we become foolish and we go back into sin and we live a sinful life and we live a dirty life and we live a defiled life, it says a fools because of their sins, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, the afflicted, their soul abhorreth all manner of meat and they draw near unto the gates of death. They become so sick, they are almost dying. Why? Because they were foolish and they lived lives they shouldn't live. And you see, that may even affect other people. We're looking at uh, First Chronicles chapter First Chronicles chapter twenty one. First Chronicles chapter twenty one. If a leader becomes foolish, you know something can happen to you people who are following that person if a builder becomes uh, foolish and does not follow the specifications uh, that the architect had given, something may happen and lives can be endangered so we cannot say it's because of Satan, it's because of evil spirit, we must avoid foolishness. First uh, Chronicles chapter 7 and I'm reading from verse 8 I'll back up to verse 7 later, but you will see what I'm reading in verse 8. And David said unto, unto God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this sin. Now I beseech thee, do away with the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done, tell me, I have done how? Very foolishly, it says, I've done something foolish. And that foolishness of David had a consequence. You're an adult, you're a father, and you do something that is foolish. You're a mother, and you do something that is foolish. You are a leader, and you do something that is foolish. You're a bishop, and you do something that is foolish. Anywhere you are, whoever you are, you do something that is foolish. That foolishness of man is going to have consequence look at verse 7 it says god was displeased with this sin therefore he smote israel therefore he smote israel look at verse 14 so the lord sent pestilence upon israel and there fell of israel how many people seventy thousand men because of the foolish thing that the leader, that the king, that David had done. Look at uh, verse 17. In verse 17, and David said unto God, Is it not I that commanded the people to be numbered? Even I it is that have sinned and done evil indeed. But as for these sheep, what have they done? Let thine hand be. Be, let thy hand, I pray thee, O Lord my God, be on me and on my father's house, but not on thy people that they should be plagued. The point is, in life, as adults, if we do any foolish thing, it affects people around us. Number one, outcome of sin on self, that is, you are a person, a man, a woman, a believer, a leader, and you do something foolish. Number one is the outcome of that evil sin on yourself. Number two, the outspread of sin on others. The consequence of what we do on other people, other people around us, other people in our family, other people in our local church, other people in our community, in our environment. Number three, the outflow of sin into eternity. Number one, the outcome of sin on self. We're looking at uh, Micah chapter 6 and we're reading from verse 13. Micah chapter 6 and I'm reading here from verse 13. Sin has consequences. It has consequences on self, that is, on the person who committed the sin, has consequences on the community, the companions around him, around her, has consequences also, even in eternity. Micah chapter, chapter 6, verse, verse 13. Therefore also will I make thee sick, in smiting thee, in making thee desolate, because of thy sins. 
These are adults. This is not somebody who is a baby who is just born into the world. These are adults now, and we're responsible people. And we have tasted Calvary, and we have been cleansed and washed in the blood of the Lamb. And we profess we're born again and to be saved. It says, as we go back to sin, that sin has consequence. Somebody pushed me, don't allow yourself to be pushed. Somebody deceived me, don't allow yourself to be deceived. Somebody tempted me, don't yield to temptation. Somebody pulled me into it, don't allow that. Because God says in that verse 13, Therefore also when I make thee sick, in smiting thee, in making thee desolate because of thy sins. I pray God will make us watchful. I say God will make us watchful. Yes. First Corinthians, first Corinthians, we're reading from chapter 11. First Corinthians chapter 11, and here we're reading from verse 29. First Corinthians chapter 11, reading from verse 29. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to, to who? I say to who? To the church? To the neighbors? No. To the children? No. To who? Himself. Sin has consequences on the person that committed the sin. It says, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning uh, the Lord's body. Look at verse 30. For this cause many are weak, for this cause many are sickly among you, for this cause many sleep, many die. Number two, the outspread of sin on others. The outspread of sin on others. There are times when somebody commits sin as an adult, the people around him may suffer as a result of that as well. And let's look at Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 14. Genesis chapter 12, we're reading from verse 14. I'm assuming you're opening your Bible. I said I'm assuming you're opening your Bible. What a good church. God bless you. Genesis chapter 12, reading from verse 14. It says, And it came to pass, when Abraham was come into Egypt, that the Egyptians beheld the woman, that she was very fair, that is, Sarah, the, the wife. And the princes also of Pharaoh saw her, and they commended, they recommended her before Pharaoh, that's somebody else's wife, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. Look at this. And he entreated Abraham well for her sake. And he had she, and, and he had sheep and oxen and asses and men servants and uh, mid servants and she asses and camels and the Lord tell me. And who? And his house with what? Because of what? Because of Sarai, Abraham. So you see that this Pharaoh, a king in the land, and saw another man's wife and took Abraham's wife. And after that, now God plagued Pharaoh and plagued his whole house because of Sarah. Abraham, so chapter 20, chapter 20, sin has consequence on other people around you. So if you sin, there's a consequence for yourself, there's a consequence on other people around. We're looking at chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 2. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she's my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerah, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she is my sister. And she, even she herself, said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands, have I done this? God said unto him in a dream, yeah, yes, I know that thou didst it in the 
integrity of thine heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me, therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Now, therefore, restore the man. Now, therefore, now, therefore, this Genesis at the very beginning, and this is God himself teaching restitution to Abimelech. This is not, you know, deeper life coming or deeper life doctrine. This is not Elijah. This is not Elisha. This is not Moses. This is God himself, even before the giving of the law. And he told the man, the king of Geram, this Abimelech, now therefore restore the man, his wife. For he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know that thou shalt, know that thou shalt surely die. Thou and does one person's sin affect other people? Of course it does. It says you'll die, you and all thine house. Look at verse 8. Therefore, Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told all these things in their ears. And the men were so afraid. And then it goes on to tell us what Abimelech eventually did. He did what the Lord told him. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, and Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham and tell me the rest. And did what? Restored him his wife. Look up here for a moment. Some people say, that, you know, I've been hearing about that restitution, you know. But I find that restitution is very, very tough and difficult because you don't understand. Now, here is Sarah with Abimelech. And Abimelech is saying, I find this thing very difficult. I find it very tough. Abimelech, tell me what God said. God said, if I don't restore her, I will die. Okay, you choose between death and restitution. You do restitution, you stay alive. You don't do restitution, you are going to die. Which one do you choose? Counsel Abimelech now. What should Abimelech do? Do restitution and stay alive. And then all your people are going to stay alive. Do restitution and you will stay alive. You stay alive spiritually. You stay alive physically. And the many, many miracles of God will come upon your life in Jesus' name. Look at verse 17. Look at verse 17. So Abraham prayed unto God and God healed Abimelech and his wife. Wife had been affected and his uh, maid servant. Servants have been affected and they bear children. Look at verse 18. For the Lord at first closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. You know, another, uh, let, let's come to this. Let's come to Jonah. Jonah, did somebody's sin affects other people. And if you remain in that sin, you enjoy your life, you destroy your life, and then you destroy many other people around you. We're looking at Jonah chapter 1, and we're reading from verse, uh, we're reading from verse 1. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry, uh, and cry against it, for the wickedness is come all before me. But, he was going to disobey, but was going to rebel, but was going to go the negative direction, the opposite direction. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa and he found a sheep going to Tarshish. So he paged the fear thereof and went down unto it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Verse 4, what did the Lord do? But the Lord sent out a great wind 
into the sea. You see, sin affects that individual. But Jonah was not alone. He was in the ship. And that sin is going to affect all the other people. They look at verse 4. And, and the, but the Lord said, a great wind into the sea. And there was a mighty tempest in the sea. So that the ship was like to be broken. Look at verse 13. Eventually, nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to land, but it could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against, against, how many people? All of them, all of them. Because of the sin of Jonah, that tempest came upon Jonah and came upon the rest of them. Wherefore, they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let, not, let, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, what happened? Tell me out loud there. And the sea ceased from her reaching. Because he was the problem. Was well, get rid of the problem. Get that problem out of your life. And then peace will come in your life. Now the outflow of sin into eternity. The outflow of sin into eternity. We're looking at 4 Samuel chapter 3. 4 Samuel chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 13. The consequence of sin does not stop here. Only on earth it goes on into eternity forever and ever. Look at 1 uh, Samuel chapter 3 verse 13. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever, 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 for the iniquity which he knows because his sons made themselves vile and restrained them not eternity. We're looking at Psalm 92. Psalm 92. I'm reading from verse 6. Psalm 92. And we're reading from verse 6. In Psalm 92 verse 6, it says, a brutish man knoweth not, neither does a fool consider this, when the wicked spring as the grass, and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they might be destroyed, how long? Forever and ever. And that's the reason why we need to take care so that no sin will remain in our lives in Jesus' name. Jude, we're reading Jude, has only one chapter. Jude, chapter 1, we're reading from verse 12. In verse 12, it says, These are spots in your feast of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruits wither it, without fruit, twice dead. Plucked up by the roots. Look at verse 13. Reaching waves of the sea. Foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness. Reserved the darkness of blackness forever. And so we see that sin has eternal consequences. We're coming back now to John. John chapter Nine. As we look at John chapter 9, we'll come to point number 3. Point number 3, the obedience of meaningful faith in Christ. We're looking at John chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 4. It says, I must walk the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can walk. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Verse 6, when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and he made clay of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind with the clay. And he said unto him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation said. And he went his way, and, the, the, and went his way therefore, and washed 
and came seen. Look at verse 8. And the neighbors, therefore, and they that before had seen him that was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, Is like him. But he said, Show yourself. But he said, Testify and tell the people that I am he. And then he said, and some, it says, and some said, this is he. Others said, he is like him. But he said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, how are thine eyes opened? He answered and said, a man that is called Jesus, what's the name of your savior? What's the name of your healer? What's the name of your deliverer? Jesus, that's his name. He'll do it for you. He made clay and he anointed mine eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and I washed and I received sight. Then said they to him, Where is he? He said, I know not. As we look at this in closing, number one, the occupation of the true Christ. The occupation of the true Christ. Look at what he says here. I must walk the works of him that sent me. While it is day. He said, I have a work to do. Look at John chapter 4 verse 34. John chapter 4 verse 34. He tells us, Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. To finish his work. I must work while yet it is day. And my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And we are to do the same thing. It tells us in chapter 19 of Luke. Luke chapter 19. I'm reading from verse 13. He called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds. And he said unto them, Occupy till I come. Occupy till I come. I pray you'll be occupied until it comes in Jesus' name. And then he says, while I'm the world, I'm the light of the world. And he tells us the same thing, you know, that if we're believers and we're following after him, we too were the light of the world. Matthew chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 14. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. Yeah, the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men. My light will shine. Or are you there? My light will shine. Your light will shine in Jesus' name. Let your light so shine before men uh, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in uh, heaven. Then we'll come back to John chapter 9. Uh, the obedience of total for total kill. The obedience to, to, for total kill. Look at uh, verse 6 and verse 7. When uh, he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground. And made clay hospital and anointed, and he anointed his eyes, the eyes of the blind man, and uh, of the blind man with the clay, and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation said, and he went his way, therefore, and he washed and came seen. He obeyed the Lord. You'll obey the Lord. And when you obey, a miracle will follow. Did you hear that? Amen. The cure will follow. The power of God will follow. The miraculous will follow your life in Jesus' name. And so he received this miracle. Look at number three now. Observation in the community. Observation in the community. We're looking at verse 8. The neighbors, therefore, they observed. And the day and day which before had seen him that was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, It's like him. 
But he said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, How are thine eyes opened? He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and received my sight. Somebody there is going to receive a sight. Going to receive this miracle. Uh, let, let's look at what this man is saying uh, and let's look uh, very clearly now as we end uh, the obedience of total cure. Many people do not understand how to receive a miracle. They, they think that, you know, every time it's the same method every time. Look at what Jesus did here. The man was blind. I was blind from birth. And when Jesus saw him, uh, he went to him uh, and then he spat on the ground and he made the spittle from the clay and then by uh, blocked out the Side, that even well, even was was in the situation, and then after doing that, without explaining anything, without telling him why he did what he did, and the man must have been wondering. He said, "Now go to the push side loam, and he didn't send Peter to go with him. He didn't send Matthew or John to go with him. I said, go and wash in the pool side loam, and you will see. And the man, without any question, just obeyed that, and he said, I went and I washed and I received my sight. I went and I washed and I received my sight. Somebody there, I went, I washed and I received my sight. Somebody there again, I went and washed and received my sight. You receive in Jesus' name. What kind of obedience is that? Number one, obedience without complaint. Obedience without complaint. Why did you do that to me? What did you even make my case was? What did you put clay on my eyes? There was no question at all. Obedience without complaint. Go and wash in the poor side, Luan, and then you will see. Number two, obedience without consultation. Obedience without consultation. He don't consult with anybody. The Lord had told him he had had the commandment of God, and he went and he washed and he saw. Number three, obedience without companionship. You see, there are many people who have heard the word of God. When I see so and so doing it, then I will comply. When I see so and so complying, then I will jump up. When I see so and so doing it, I want somebody to bail the cart. I want somebody to go before me. This man had obedience without companionship. Number four, obedience without comparison. The man did not say, hey, Jesus, I heard you heal the blind man in Matthew. And in Matthew, you didn't make any clear to, you know, stop their sight. You just uh, said, open, you just, uh, open your eyes and they see their sight. Why don't you do that to me? Yeah, I've read that you, you, I heard about it, somebody in Mark and then in Mark, you just said, what do you want that shall done to you? And the man said that I should receive my sight. Okay, receive your sight and they receive their sight. I heard about somebody in Luke and as they approach you like this, we just touch them and then they receive their side. But me, look at what you have done. No comparison. You see, if you are going to receive a miracle, see what he has told you. Hear what he has told you. It's obedience without comparison. Number five, obedience without contention. Obedience without argument. Obedience without fighting. You know, when you have just even a kind of a grain of sand in your eye, if you try to blink your eye, you'll be feeling the pain. Am I right? But now look at this man. Jesus made clay and put it on both eyes. And to even close the eye or to blink the eye, there'll be difficulty and challenge. But the man did not contend with Jesus Christ and said, hey, you must explain this one to me because I'm, now I'm feeling pain. I cannot blink my eye very well. It's obedience without contention. I pray God will help every one of us. And then number six, obedience without comprehension. I don't understand this. I can't ever understand this. How will Jesus do this to me? He didn't even use water to mix the clay. It was his own spittle. Doesn't he have a bottle of drinking water there? He brings some water there for me. And then he made spittle and made the clay and put on my eyes. And then now go and wash that off. And you will see. How can I comprehend this? No, I don't comprehend. Obedience without comprehension. 
instruction number seven obedience before the kill obedience before the kill when jesus put the clay the man was still blind as he was taking the first step was he blind second step was he blind as he was going and going and going he was still blind but he said i know when i come to the end of this obedient tree my eyes are going to open and your eyes are going to open i said your eyes are going to open it will open in jesus name obedience obedience before the kill christ is still speaking to the just as god who is on high speak to men in this gone by so the lord is still speaking today and calling men today and my brother my sister this is true whatsoever he says to you don't complain don't grumble don't consult don't uh, complain and, and uh, don't have any contention don't uh, have don't say i'm waiting for a companion to do this whatsoever he says unto you there is but one thing to do what's that just obey if you are in the savior's hand you must do as he commands for there is no other way. Never put the message by. Never stop to question why. Why did you do that? Why did you put clay on my eyes? Why are you sending me in a place I have not gone before? Never reason to say why. Uh, to reason why. When the Savior speaks to you, what do we do? Just to be. If you, if for mansions on high your side. If that land, be, if you are in that land beyond the sky, after time which you has passed away, though the way you may not see, Christ is calling, follow me. And faith and duty, meaningful faith, and faith and duty, manifestation of faith, and faith and duty, both will cry, just obey, just obey, just obey. That's the way, God's way, when his message comes to you, there is but one thing to do, just obey, just obey. And at the end of that line of obedience, a miracle will meet you there. Let's rise up, let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. This is your time, this is your time of miracle, this is your time of breakthrough, but just to be, just to be. This is the time when you'll open those blind eyes, just to be, just to be. This is the time, he'll tell you to rise up and walk, just to be, just to be. This is the time, it's going to give you grace, grace for obedience and grace to do the will of the Lord. He calls you to repent, just to be, just to be. He calls you to depend upon him just obey, just obey. He calls you to look at Calvary, just obey, just obey. He calls you to go and wash in the pool of Siloam and wash in the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses you, that washes you, that takes all your sins away. Just obey, just obey. He calls you be ye holy, for I am holy. Just obey, just obey. He calls you to tarry until you are power from on high. Just obey, just obey. He calls you that will be obedient to the word of the Lord and he says, just obey, just to be is the way God's way when the Savior speaks to you there is but one thing to do just obey just obey